Welcome. Today we're going to talk about Enneagram, Myers-Briggs, and human design. I'm going to do a really short one today, and we're just going to kind of go over... Um, we're not going to go over all 16 Myers-Briggs types. If you're in objective personality, you'll be more familiar with what I'm doing. Objective personality is an offshoot of Jungian typology, just like Myers-Briggs is. And in the objective personality system, we have a fundamental division between the EJ types in Myers-Briggs, the ESTJ, ENTJ, ESFJ, ENFJ, versus the IPs, INTP, INFP, ISTP, ISFP. Then we have the INTJs, like me, with the ISTJs, the INFJs and the ISFJs. And then those are going to be contrary to the ESTPs, ESFPs, um, ENTPs, and ENFPs. So we have these fundamental divisions between EJIP and between IPEP. So that's kind of where we're going to look at those. Then for Enneagram, I'm just going to quickly go through the nine Enneagram types with the I'm okay, you're okay. So I'm not sure who came up with this. If anyone knows you know, the credit for this, please put it in the YouTube comments and I'll credit that person. But I, I was taught Enneagram and I learned Enneagram through a shorthand to remember the different types. And you can phrase these different ways, but as an Enneagram one, I'm okay if I'm perfect, you're okay if you're perfect. Can also be phrased, I'm okay if I'm right, you're okay if you're right. For the two, I'm okay if I'm being recognized for what I do for you, you're okay if you recognize what I do for you. Also known as, I'm okay if I'm being flattered, you're okay if you're being flattered. For the Enneagram 3, the achiever, we have, uh, I'm okay if I'm being recognized for my achievements, you're okay if you recognize me for your achievements. For the 4, I'm okay if I'm unique, you're okay, you know, if you recognize my uniqueness. But I actually phrase this a different way. I phrase it, I'm okay if I'm in pain, you're okay if you're in pain because it's not really about, it's more about authenticity and pain doesn't lie. You know, um, I, I, I guess we could say like w with Lacan, he said, anxiety is the only emotion which doesn't lie. Well, anxiety is a form of pain. It's the pain of the spirit, you could say. So if anxiety is the pain of the spirit and if anxiety is the only emotion which doesn't lie, uh, you know, actually, and in, in maybe I'll, I'll touch on this when we get to the four, it's funny because the growth of the four is to learn to stop trusting their feelings. They've been trusting all their feelings. They haven't been trusting their anxiety. The anxiety is the whisper that says, don't trust your feelings. There's something else there behind it, you know. And, um, but, you know, as anyone in human design knows, the spleen is completely overwhelmed by the screaming, raging solar plexus. So it's no... A surprise that a feeling type, you know, in Enneagram is, is going to have, is going to need to grow by listening to their intuition and by not trusting their feelings and waiting for that to emerge. But as we see when we move on, I don't think that Enneagram 4 people necessarily have a defined solar plexus or an undefined, or I don't think that there's any correlations like this. There may be distributions, so it might be more common for a defined solar plexus person to be in the feeling triad or something like that, but I don't actually see, um, you know, I, I, I don't see it that, that strict. Moving on to the five, that's I'm okay if I'm not feeling, you're okay if you're not making me feel. Now this is a funny one, I mean, you imagine the five wing four, they have the wing of, I'm okay if I'm in pain, if I'm feeling intense emotions. You're okay if you're in pain. But meanwhile, their five is, I'm okay if I'm not feeling, you're okay if you're not feeling. So it really, the four wing five and the five wing four have a little tricky time of it. Moving on to the six, it's basically, I'm okay if I'm safe, you're okay if you enhance my safety, you're okay if you don't endanger me, you don't increase risk, you know. Uh, the seven is, I'm okay if I'm being filled up, you're okay if you're filling me up. And then the eight is, I'm okay if I'm strong, you're okay if you're weak, or you're okay if you know I'm stronger than you. And so they, they want to be the strongest, like I am strongest, not even strong. And you're okay if you know I'm strongest. And then uh, the nine is, I'm okay if I'm included, you're okay if you include me. It's often phrased, I'm okay if you play with me, you're okay if you play with me. Or, I'm okay if you let me play with you. It's a very playful side to the nine. I have a nine wing, so I have that playful side, and I'm familiar with it. Okay, so all this is just so we're on the same page then when we talk about how does this reconcile with human design. Well, the first thing you need to know is that Enneagram and Myers-Briggs and Objective Personality and Jungian Type, none of this will wake you up. 
The closest thing that might wake you up is individuation, Jungian individuation as a progressive subjective destitution, a loss of phantasmatic supports, a loss of the fantasies that structure our life, and a sort of waking up into a new uh, post-analytic reality where you, you have analyzed yourself, you have given up your belief in fundamentally having lost something, and you have acquiesced and surrendered to instead a fundamental lack. This gets into Lacan, and I know that most people don't like to mix their Jung and Lacan, but I actually find them quite compatible in certain areas, in certain ways. Um, so, you know, that might help you wake up. That might. But really, human design is here for awakening. Human design is the structuring of awakening. That's what Ra did. He had the channel of structuring and this channel of, you know, awakening. He had the channel of uh, initiation as well. So he initiates us. He structures the initiation of awakening. And what do we awaken to? Well, he also had the channel of perfected form. We awake to perfected form. We awake to how our form can be perfected. So, you know, that's what human design is for. None of these other systems are gonna wake you up. I was talking about destiny cards recently, love cards. They're not gonna wake you up. I've met somebody using destiny cards for 20 years who's a very, very angry manifester. He was my old landlord. And he was so angry and he was so not self, he didn't inform anybody of anything. And he was completely asleep. You know, you could flick him on the head, he was that asleep. I mean, in the sense, not literally, but he was asleep to the reality around him. And he thought everyone else was to blame and he thought he did nothing wrong and he thought, how dare anybody want me to inform them? And he was angry all the time and just a very miserable person. And he had devoted 20 years of his life to destiny cards. And he used the destiny cards to make decisions about everything. He gave me the apartment because I'm a queen of hearts. And he goes, oh, you're a queen of hearts. You're a good card for me. Talk about giving away your authority to something else, right? Talk about not trusting your inner authority, just giving away all of your authority to a system and saying, hey, according to the system, we're good. So according to the system, I'm going to decide now to let you move in here. Turned out it was, it was horrible. He, he couldn't stand me. He complained all the time. He'd bang on the walls. He was always angry. It was miserable. I ended up moving my bed the farthest away from the shared wall. He, he lived in the back. Never live with an angry manifester in the same building. It's just... And you know, what was funny was he's a touch healer and a psychic healer. And he made all of his money doing remote healing. And he would also do touch healing and stuff like that. So very angry person, very asleep. So none of these systems are going to wake you up. And yet when you're awake, you start to see the signposts of the systems. There are signposts, right? You start to see um, the signpost in objective personality of the triggers that trigger your so-called demons, as they call them. Or you start to see the signposts for Jungian stuff of the inferior function. You start to see the inferior function come up. In Enneagram, there's signposts of disintegration. Well, what it all comes down to, and this is going to be a short one today, so I'm just going to give you one thing to kind of think about. If you know your Enneagram type, great. If you know your Myers-Briggs type, even better. If you know your Myers-Briggs type, but you haven't got into objective personality or got into a more in-depth view of Jungian typology, I would recommend that first, because you might not be the Myers-Briggs type you think you are. But if you know it, great. And if you're pretty confident, and so on. Um, and then as we go through, I'll just talk about what these big triggers of bad are. There was a great website a few years back called ptypes.com. I don't know if it's still around, but it talked about the false good and the false bad. And it, it's basically a stoic thought. And according to stoicism and stoic thinkers, and even neo-stoicism, the only real good is, you know, um, the only real good is virtue and the only real bad is vice. And virtue is not what we think it is. Everyone has a false good, which they pretend is virtuous. And again, that's what I'm saying. Like the Enneagram 1, false good is being moralistic. It's good to be moralistic. Enneagram 2, false good. It's good to be recognized for, if people appreciate me and recognize me, it's good. If they don't recognize me, it's bad. Um, sounds like projectors, right? Uh, for Enneagram 3, if I'm, you know, I can achieve all day long. It means nothing as long as I'm recognized for my achievement. If you recognize my achievement, I'm good. If you don't recognize it, it's bad. Enneagram 4, I can be as unique, I can be the most unique person in the world, but as long as, you know, you're not in pain, how do I know you really get it, right? So you better be in pain just like I'm in pain, and then we'll both know that we're both being authentic. So the false good is being in pain. The false good is being authentic through pain, right? Um, the five, the false good is going to be avoiding feeling. Feeling is bad. 
being rational and being reasonable and well feelings are rational but don't tell a five that you know don't because the Enneagram five sees feeling as all kind of you know irrational and they don't acknowledge the rationality of feeling um, as not self anyway or as their sort of problem right the six says it's good to be safe it's bad to take unnecessary risks it's bad to take risks period it's good to be cautious it's good to be you know secure the seven says it's good to be filled up it's bad to be deprived and in pain it's bad to be forced to experience something it's bad to be trapped it's bad to be imprisoned it's you know well who's to say it's like the chinese saying good bad who knows that was one of ra's favorite sayings um good news bad news who knows do we really know if it's good news or bad news do we really know right and then um eight good to be strong bad to be weak well try being an enneagram eight and growing old you know uh, i'm seeing that with my good friend von paul he's in his 70s and he's an enneagram eight and it's very hard for him to be weak when you grow old, you grow weak, and that's a bad for him, so that he would rather die than be weak, you know, he often says. And that's a very eight sentiment. Uh, they just want to be strong at all costs. Well, the nine is most afraid of being canceled and most afraid of being excluded. It's good if I'm included. It's good if I'm, it's good if there's peace and harmony. It's bad if there's discord and, you know, it, no, it's not. It just is, right? And so I think that's the stoic point here. But the thing is, even stoicism won't wake you up. That's what's funny. It might prepare you, but human design is really the science of awakening. Once you've awakened with human design, you can go back to stoicism, you can go to Enneagram, you can go to any of these, and you can start to see them in terms of their false goods and their false bads in a totally new light. And with that awakening, I just want to now say, we'll just kind of go through them. We'll start with the Myers-Briggs types, and then we'll move on to the Enneagram, and I'll just kind of talk about if you're in the human design experiment, and then you are this type, what you might look for as a signpost. So one moment, then, then we'll begin. Starting with Myers-Briggs, if you're an EJ, that is, if you're ENTJ, ESTJ, ENFJ, ESFJ, your false good is going to be being seen as being um, thick-skinned, independent, and not needing other people. You know, and your false bad, like not needing the approval of others. And your false bad is going to be when people see you as being selfish. If people see you as being self-centered, that's horror for an EJ. The worst thing in the world for them is to be seen as being selfish. And they aren't. I mean, they break their back all the time for people. The EJ is the most giving to the tribe. Although it's always with a secret positioning of themselves. This is why EJs get paid the highest among all personality types. You find the ENTJ, the ESTJ, followed by ENFJ and ESFJ among the highest paid across the board. Because with this willingness to help others comes a sort of a hidden positioning of oneself in a reward situation. The worst thing for the EJ, for their not self, is this fear of being selfish. So I'm going to say, don't worry about being selfish. Say you're an EJ generator, you're, you know, and you have, um, I'll leave out the splits for now because it's easier to talk about centers, but we can say like, say you have undefined ego and you're a generator, you're going to be initiating to try to prove to others how unselfish you are, right? And EJ is going to initiate, no, 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 like, like it's almost like they're, they're watching and then somebody says, well, you know, they took that for themselves and they didn't give anybody to anybody else. And then the EJ has to initiate and go, no, no, no. That's not true. I only took it temporarily so I could help others, so it would be this and this and this. They feel the need to explain themselves. Now, similarly, the EJ is going to have this big core issue of wanting 10 other people to tell them that they approve, to validate them, so, so they can do it. So it's like, hey, I'm thinking of quitting medical school. I'm thinking of being a poet. Well, first of all, almost no EJ would do that, right? Because that's much more of an IP thing. But the EJ says, I want to quit medical school. I want to be a poet. Well, in order for them to even say it, they first have to like have people that they emulate. And this, is, of course, is not self. If you're wide awake in human design, you don't need anything. You're trusting your own inner authority. You're just responding, uh-huh, I'm going to be a poet. Uh-huh, I want to quit medical school. And then off you go. But I'm talking about the not self, where we're always trying to figure things out. You know, So the EJ is not self. is going to be like, well, I better ask my mentor. I better ask my mom. I better ask my dad. I better ask my childhood friend. I better ask all these people I look up to and admire. You know, the EJ looks up and admires people and needs 10 of them. It's the 10 to 1 rule. 10 people need to give me permission to do it before I'll do it. Well, with human design, you learn it's not, that's a false good. The false good, having approval of others is a false good. 
For the IP, it's the opposite. It's the 10 to 1 rule opposite. They decide to drop out. It takes 10 people shaking them by the shoulders to say, you should reconsider it. You're crazy. You're in a great situation here. You should keep going this way. Why are you leaving this all behind? You know, but the IP is going to trust. And you might say, well, then is it easier for the IP and human design? No, because they're still trusting their mind. They're still trusting some other authority that's not really themselves. They're trusting what they think, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's the same problem either way. But I guess I'm just saying as an IP, you're not really afraid of being selfish. You're afraid of being seen as a sellout. You're afraid of being seen as fake. You're afraid of being seen as, uh, you know, basically just influenced by other people or boring or plain or homogenized or all these things. So again, you might say, well, isn't the IP at a special advantage for human design then? because they're kind of away from the norm anyway. No, no, they're not at a special advantage. In fact, they can be at a disadvantage because they're already so anti-normative, they can get so homogenized. Here's the thing, homogenization is everywhere. If you go into the anti-normative fringes, they're just as homogenizing. James Hillman said something really good here. He's an INFJ, very astute. And he said, uh, or he was, you know, he passed away a few years ago. And he said, they asked him if he was counterculture. And he said, no, no, I'm not against, nor am I with the mainstream. I stand slightly askew to the daily round. I stand slightly askew to the daily round. I'm not completely against it. I'm just slightly askew. I'm ready to question it. I'm ready, you know. So I, th that's how I feel about it. But I guess the signpost, if you're an IP, would be it's not bad to let other people influence you. It's not bad to listen to other people. And then at the same time, they're constantly trying to convince others how, how much they care about them. Just like the EJ tries to convince how thick skinned they are, but really they're seeking validation. It's not bad for people to see you as thin skinned EJ. And it's also not bad for you to seek validation, but it's also not bad for you to not seek validation. I mean, that's the whole point of being free from these shackles is that you're no longer, you can see the signposts but you're no longer bound to act based on something that happens. You're acting based on your inner authority. So again, if it's an EJ, signpost for like triggers for the not self. Someone saying you're selfish. Okay, first of all, it's not bad if people see you're selfish. Somebody saying they don't approve of you. That's a huge trigger for EJs. Don't worry about it. It's okay if they don't approve of you. Um, you know, you can see the other way that they, they want to be seen as thick skinned. Don't worry if people see you as thin-skinned. It's okay if they see you as seeking approval from others. No big deal. Then for the IP, their big one, they don't want to be seen as uncaring, so they want to try to convince you how much they care about you, even though they're not really taking into account what you say. They're just making the decision for themselves. So first of all, it's not bad for people to see you as ignoring what they say. If I tell an IP, you don't care what anybody says but yourself, they get their feelings hurt. They shouldn't, you know? I mean, sorry, I shouldn't tell someone not to get their feelings hurt, but you know what I mean. Like, like, don't worry about that. That's okay if people see you as selfish. So both IP and EJ have complexes around how they're seen. It's very other-oriented. It's very people-oriented. Don't worry about that. Now, on the other hand, don't worry if people see you as, like, like you know, what is the IP really afraid of? They're afraid. I told my IP friend to make NFTs, and he goes, oh, my fans would kill me. They would, they would they would all stop being my fans. I'm like, no, they wouldn't. Like, but he's so afraid of being seen as, you know, a sellout, as lacking integrity, as not being, it's like the IP is so afraid to trust what anybody else says because they think they should only trust themselves. It's independent to a fault. Here's the, what I have to say then for an IP. When you notice yourself getting triggered because a bunch of people are telling you to do something different, why don't you listen to them and actually consider doing something different? Now, I'm not saying to follow their authority. It's still about inner authority. Right? So, okay, so let's just say you're a generator, you have undefined ego, you're gonna be initiating, if you're triggered, if you're an IP, you're gonna be initiating, I'm leaving this group. As soon as the group gets too homogenized or too this or that or too normative or something, you're gonna, you know, as an IP, it's gonna trigger you. What I'm saying is the, um, the IP gets really triggered by, they, their biggest problem is basically, so, it's, it's kind of the inverse of the EJ, but it's kind of the same. It's like the EJ's biggest problem is that they're seeking validation from other people. The IP's is that they're not. So their biggest problem is that they're in their own little solipsism. They're underestimating interdependence. 
they think that they can be dependent to a fault and they get triggered when they become too dependent. So this will be the big trigger. So say you're a generator, say you have undefined ego, you're waiting to respond, and then you're an IP, and then you, be, you enter into a situation of dependency where you're being required to work with somebody else and to have all of this interdependency, that might really trigger you and you might initiate and say, I'm leaving, I can't take this, I'm out of here. And you just leave, right? Because that was so triggering. So look for these signposts. Say you're a, a projector, your bitterness might be around the fact that nobody recognizes you know, your uniqueness and in that, in that you're bitter because you're not being invited into situations where you get to make all the decisions. Well, that's triggering to you as an IP because guess what? Collaborating is triggering to an IP. Getting to not make decisions is triggering to an IP. Having a compromise is triggering to an IP. All of this stuff. So look for these signposts. If you're an IP, you don't care what anybody says but yourself, but you've spent the entire, your entire life trying to convince everyone in your life you care about them and you care about what they say. Uh, sorry, of course you care about them, but you care about like, say an IP is like, I'm gonna be a poet. I'm gonna drop out of medical school and be a poet. You do not care that everybody else thinks that's a bad idea and they think you'd be a great doctor and they think you should stay in medical school, right? Just as an IP, you just don't care. Now, with human design, we know, hey, follow your sacral authority, follow your emotional authority, follow your splenic, you know, whatever your authority is, follow it and you will make the right decision. And it, maybe it turns out that all the conditioning from all the people telling you to quit medical school is just their conditioning. Screw them. Maybe you are supposed to be a poet. But maybe your belief to be a poet is because your not self is so triggered into saying, I don't want to be normie. I don't want to be normative. I don't want to be part of this homogenized collective, medical school, whatever. So I guess my point is that the IPs can often trick themselves into thinking they're much more radical than they are. Because they're already on the fringe of society, they think that they're kind of in the human design experiment, but it doesn't mean they are. You know, I've met so many IPs who you can't get through to them. You cannot get through to them, right? The risk with the IP is that they'll try to convince you you've gotten through to them, they'll trick you into believing you've gotten through to them, and yet it's, it's a wall. And so if you're an IP, you know, your biggest trigger is being influenced by other people and letting other people in. Um, it's okay, you know, it's okay. Like if you're an ITP, maybe you're really triggered by that FE. If you're an uh, IFP, maybe you're really triggered by that TE. Either way, it has to do with other people, interfacing, interacting, community. Where do you stand in the community? All of these are signposts for basically the mind is gonna jump in and try to get you to initiate if you're a generator, try to get you to invite yourself if you're a projector and so on try to get you to stop informing if you're a manifester. The mind kind of convinces you to live the not self through the carrot and the stick. And the carrot and the stick for the IP is, you know, like I was saying, um, the stick being, you know, letting others influence you or becoming too dependent or interdependent or giving away your independence, stuff like that. Okay, now we move on to the EP and the, um, the IJ. So I'm an IJ, my false good, I'm gonna kind of speed it up here because this is gonna be a short one and then we're gonna get to Enneagram real quick. But with the um, IJ, all IJs have control freak issues. So my issue is control freak stuff because I'm an INJ. All INJs have control freak issues around conceptual and meaning. Like I had an INFJ convince me, try to convince me. I never try to convince anyone of anything ever. That's control freak because he didn't like being seen or being understood as someone who tries to convince people of things. So he took it upon himself to try to convince you that he never tries to convince anybody of anything. So, and I've seen this with, you know, undefined ego, and there, there's other ways of looking at it. I've used that example for ego as well, that they try to prove to you, they never try to prove anything, and, and so on. So you can see how they conflate. But for an IJ, chaos is gonna be the enemy. So I'm an IJ generator. It's really hard for me not to initiate when there's a lot of chaos. It's like, say I'm doing something, it's going along, everything's fine, then a bunch of unexpected stuff happens and changes come in and all this chaos, I want to initiate and say, okay, change the scene, we're doing this now. But I can't do that because I'm a generator. Whenever I do that, everything goes wrong because I've started the initiate. I'm like, okay, party's over, and then everything goes wrong. Or I'm like, okay, we're doing this now, change the plan. You know. So when I change the plan and make a new plan, I'm initiating to try to regain control of a chaotic situation. That's a signpost for me, not self. On the other hand, the EP hates being controlled. They try to prove to you how responsible they are, just like I try to prove how laid back I am. 
I'm not a control freak. Look how laid back I am. Well, the EP says, I'm not an irresponsible idiot. I'm a, sorry, but you know, I'm not irresponsible. I, you can trust me. I'll pay you back. Sure, give me the money or I'll show up at work on time. You can trust me. They never pay you back. They never show up at work on time. You know, they're EPs. Like that's their whole thing. The EP is the least responsible of the types. And you know, what's funny is I've always had EPs tell me, I get my responsibilities done. And that's how you can tell they're irresponsible. Because IJs know that there's no such thing as a finished responsibility. It's an ongoing responsibility. And what the EP does is it goes, look, I agreed to do this, to do this, and to do this, and I did all three of those things. I'm responsible. And they're trying to prove to you how responsible they are by showing that they check the things off the list. But every IJ knows that list is just there. The list doesn't mean anything. To really be responsible, you have to be responsible 24-7. You have to be responsible to know when the list isn't enough. You have to be responsible to know when some more action is required. The EP does the bare minimum, gets off the hook, and then they, and then when everything goes, to, it fails, you tell them, hey, it failed because of your lack of responsibility. And they go, no, I was responsible. See, I'm covered. I did this and this and this. And they show you their little technical things that they did to prove that they were responsible. The evidence they were irresponsible is that the whole thing failed. If there was somebody responsible for making sure it succeeded, it would have succeeded. So this is a signpost for the EP. EPs get really triggered when you tell them they're irresponsible because they want to prove to you how responsible they are. If you're an EP and you're getting really triggered right now by me telling you you're irresponsible, don't worry about it. It's okay that I see you as irresponsible. Who cares? Who cares, right? And the other thing that they're going to be really, really triggered by is being controlled. So they get into a situation that seems easygoing and then a couple weeks later they're at a job and they say, okay, look, we're, we're doing a new thing. We're going to need to actually have daily check-ins. You're going to have to, and then they quit. The EP quits because suddenly there's more control and they don't like all this new control. And again, they have the false bad. Control is a false bad for the EP. If you're an EP, it's not bad to be controlled. It's okay to be controlled. If you're an IJ, it's not bad for things to be chaotic. It's not bad to waste money on dumb things. It's not bad to drive across town multiple times because you forgot the thing the first time. It's okay. All the chaos of life is okay. If you're an IJ, the chaos of life is just what life is. If you're an EP, all of the control of life is okay. Don't worry about being controlled. That's part of life too. Okay, now we're going to move on to the Myers-Briggs, but I hope you can see so far, or sorry, from the Myers-Briggs to the Enneagram. I hope you can see so far the kind of pattern here, which is that there's going to be triggers, there's going to be this false bad and false good, and as long as I can achieve the false good, I'll be satisfied and I'll be successful and I'll be peaceful and I'll be surprised. And if I can't, then I'm going to be frustrated and angry and bitter and disappointed, right? And that is what the mind tells us. That's the not self. It tells us, hey, you're a four. You better prove to them that you're unique, you know? And so let's just talk about it now. As we go through, I'm just going to use different undefined centers. So for Enneagram one, starting with the ego, let's just do the ego. They're going to try to prove to you moral superiority. And the initiation, if you're a generator with undefined ego, you're going to want to initiate and say, hey, you know, like, here's a great example. I'm a generator with undefined ego, and I'm, I'm Enneagram 1. And before I was in human design, I would get in flame wars all the time with philosophy people. Well, during my first year of deconditioning, someone was posting about how Jung supported the Nazis. Side note, only in the past few months, new evidence has come out that Jung not only did not support the Nazis, but was a secret agent in that the semi-pro-German things that came out were only so he could get even closer in order to betray them for the Allies. He was a spy working for the Allied forces. And, um, you know, so Jung was a spy. Very cool, very cool. And this actually finally, you know, vindicates puts these threats to rest. But I mean, I would, was arguing for multiple years with people like Daniel Tutt, Harrison Fluss. I just think they're complete idiots when it comes to Jung, and I'm not afraid to say so, because they literally try to link the rise of right-wing extremism to a proto-Jungian resurgence of Jung and Jordan Peterson and this and that. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. But my point is, I'm Enneagram 1, so when I see somebody say something wrong, it's hugely triggering to me. And then I'm right, and I tell them, hey, this you're wrong, and this is right. What I'm saying is correct, and you're wrong. And then they tell me, no, Jonah, you're wrong, and I'm right. And then that's even more triggering. And then half an hour later, I'm furiously typing and proving to them with my undefined ego why they're wrong and I'm right. That's the not-self. That's the not-self. You know, moving on to Enneagram 2. Let's take undefined solar plexus. Let's say they have everything else defined but solar plexus. Make it easy, you know. Okay, what's that going to look like? Let's say they're a projector. 
Okay, they're going to be really bitter about not being appreciated, not being, not, they're, they're not going to feel appreciated that the things in their life that they do for other people, they want to be flattered. The false good is to be flattered. And so they're going to continue to try to elicit flattery or to try to like ingratiate themselves as not self-projector. Obviously as projector, we can't say everything is um, defined except the solar plexus. That would be everything defined except the sacral and the solar plexus, let's say. So this projector then is going to be pushing themselves to work hard and to prove and just keep working and keep pushing and look, I made soup for you and you were sick and I did all this. Meanwhile, with the undefined solar plexus, they're going to hide when they don't want to do things. They're going to, their worst trigger is going to be the confrontation of not helping someone, you know, and, and not wanting to be there for someone. So there's going to be this real Enneagram trigger around, you don't appreciate me and I'm going to keep working harder and keep working for people to try to get them to appreciate me. And then with the solar plexus, it's going to be, and I'll never let you know this. I will hide it completely. I will hide my bitterness from you to the very end. I will hide, 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 and I will present a false self for your adoration. Everyone with undefined solar plexus is presenting a false self. Ra had undefined solar plexus. He said his mom thought he was a saint growing up and he was a real black sheep among his friend group, but his mom never knew. Because he had undefined solar plexus, he was able to maintain a false self and present a false self for her adoration. And that's what the undefined solar plexus does. So if you're a two, you're presenting a false self of the super helpful, the super helper, in order to be appreciated and flattered for how much you've helped. If you're a three, let's say a three and you have undefined G center, and let's say you're a manifester. Your, and you have to find solar plexus and you have to find ego. Okay, so you're a three, your false bad is going to be not being appreciated for your achievements. Three could cure cancer. They don't care. They do not care. They would rather be seen for having cured cancer and not done anything than to actually cure it and be a completely anonymous. That is the, that's the three. That's the three in a nutshell. You have the choice to cure cancer and to never be known for anything ever or you have the, the choice to not cure cancer, but to be on the team that cures cancer, to kind of manage the team and have no contribution to it other than in a managerial perspective, you know, from that place, and then to be recognized for it and get a lot of credit. The three will choose the credit because their false good is being, oh, but, oh, but of course, now, if I say this to you and you're a three and you say, I would never do that, well, do you have undefined ego? You're going to try to prove to me you would never do that because you don't want to be seen that way. The, the three is all about how they're seen. They don't want to be seen as somebody who would rather get the recognition for curing cancer and not have done it than actually cure cancer and get no recognition. So say we have this manifest or undefined G. Their not self is going to be that they're constantly searching, looking, looking, looking their whole life, go, 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 existential crisis after existential crisis, trying to find where they can get the recognition for their achievements. I have to find the people who will recognize me for my achievements. I have to find the people who I can impact with my achievements, who know how great I am and so on. And they're not gonna be informing and they're just gonna be moving around and they're going to be initiating willy-nilly, causing untold destruction as, as not self-manifestors do, having all of this huge impact on people as not self-manifestors do, negative impact on people as they continually go from place to place to place in their never-ending search because of undefined G-Center. Searching for love, searching for direction, searching for truth. And because they're Enneagram 3, they're going to get triggered to start searching again, to leave their partner, to leave their job, to move to a new place, every time they feel like they're not being recognized for their achievements. The four, their big trigger is when you're not in pain, you're too happy, and they just get this sense that Maybe they're living a fake life. Maybe they're not being authentic. Let's say they have undefined spleen. They're going to be attached to things that give them pain and make them feel authentic. You know, let's say a projector with undefined spleen and an Enneagram 4, and they have a defined solar plexus and a defined ego and a defined G center. They're going to be, because that's kind of the order of the strength, right? They're going to be holding on to all this and it's not good for them and then you'll, you'll ask them why and they'll say, because it keeps me real with myself, because it brings me authenticity. You know, you can tell it's causing them all this pain, but to them pain is good. Pain is the false good. 
right? They're in an abusive relationship. There's all this pain. They're like, well, this is good. It's real. It's authentic. And they're holding on to it and they won't let go because of that undefined spleen. Well, the growth, of course, with human design and all, all of that awakening is to let go, decondition from the undefined spleen. And then as soon as they start to decondition and loosen up that and let go, they're going to start to naturally move to Enneagram 1 and they're not going to trust their feelings so much. They're not going to trust their pain so much to guide them and so on. Uh, let's take Enneagram 5. Let's just say undefined ego again because, you know, it's... Or let's do a split death this time. Let's say you're a split death, bridging gate... Um, let's do a hard one. Bridging gate 3. Bridging gate 3. Chaos at the beginning. That's the only bridging gate. And this is somebody who, as Enneagram 5, they're going to be triggered anytime there's feeling. You could tell them, hey, I just want you to know it's really important. You're a really important friend to me. And they'll freak out. They'll freak out because you just said something intimate and feeling. You triggered a feeling in them and they go, this is bad. This person's making me feel and I'm feeling. I'm okay if I'm not feeling. You're okay if you're not making me feel. What's going on here? You know? And they get triggered. And, I've, I've had, and they start making jokes and they start to change the subject and they get uncomfortable and all this stuff. Okay, so they have bridging gate three. What are they going to do then? They're going to immediately... So they have to be a generator then because that's uh, bridging gate on the sacral to the root they're going to immediately try to initiate to create a bunch of chaos so that they don't have to feel. You know, you can kind of put these together and you can start to see that this is somebody who's, you know, chaos at the beginning. They're going to start a bunch of stuff and create a whole bunch of chaos because then all the feeling goes away and they're too busy dealing with all this chaos and, they, and they're back to being good. Again, the false good. I don't have to feel. It's like as soon as, as soon as the one is wrong, it tries to be right. It tries to correct. Say, okay, I was wrong. I was wrong. Now it's right again, you know. As soon as the two isn't recognized, it tries to do more to get recognized. Oh, I didn't get recognized for making you soup. I'm going to bake you a cake then. You know, as soon as the three doesn't get recognized for achievement, it tries to overachieve. And the four, oh, that wasn't painful enough. Well, I'll do this and make even more pain and so on. And the five is trying to get back to the safety of not feeling. Enneagram six tries to get back to the safety of safety, of just literal security, of just feeling like this isn't going to change. I, this is dependable. This is safe. And so the six, you know, I don't know that I need to make an example of a chart each time, but let's just say, regardless of your human design type, if you're an Enneagram six, there's going to be a real feeling of having to initiate, or if you're a manifester, having to do something without informing anybody, you know, or if you're emotionally defined, taking action without waiting for your clarity, there is going to be this huge trigger. If you're a reflector, taking action and not waiting your 28 days, 27 days, you know, these are going to be triggers, and your trigger for the six is going to be, there's a risk. Like, they tell you at your job, hey, you know, the job, the, it might be, it might undergo big changes. We're doing a restructuring. We hire consultants. Suddenly, trigger, 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 you know, because the safety could be gone. Or, you know, maybe your partner has an ex come to town, and that's really triggering because that you're worried that you might lose your partner to them. Maybe your house goes on the market, you're renting, and, you know, maybe you're going to have to move if it sells. All of the uncertainty is super triggering for the six. Just the fear that something might happen. And so, what are they going to do? They're going to try to initiate. They're going to initiate to get out of it. Oftentimes, quitting is initiating. Ra likes to say generators are the great quitters. And it's true. And quitting is initiating. It's initiating because it says, I'm done with this. I'm going to leave. And then usually, right after, it gets so much better. They usually quit right before it changes. It's like the stock market. You're investing, and it goes down and down and down and down, and then you finally sell. And then it shoots right back up, you know. Um, it's just like a Murphy's Law, you know. <laughs> it happened to me a lot of times, believe me. But that's what I'm trying to say is if you're a six, you're going to be so triggered, you're going to want to take action when you really shouldn't take action. You should just wait, you know, because it's not bad for, thing, for there to be insecurity. It's not bad to risk for things that you believe in and so on. The seven. The seven is going to get so... Anytime they feel trapped, they're, they're going to want to initiate. Trapped in this relationship... I'm going to initiate leaving the relationship. You know, I'm a projector, and I'm a seven, I'm trapped in the relationship. I'm going to start inviting myself to other things because I'm not being fed enough, so to speak, here. Remember, the seven is gluttonous. What it wants more than anything is to be filled up. <clears throat> and as long as it's filled up, it's fine. As long as you're filling it up, you're fine. But the moment you stop filling them up, and the moment they stop being filled up, they're triggered, and they're not fine anymore, and they want to initiate leaving. They want to quit. They want to start a new relationship. They want to, you know, I know 
what it is. I, the one has a very special relationship to the seven. The one grows to the seven. And uh, I, I know what it is, you know, to see a seven be in the pain of being trapped. And when they're in that pain of being trapped, all they want is to get out of it. So if you're a seven, the signpost I'm going to give you is notice when you're in the false bad of being stuck somewhere and being deprived and not being filled up. And that's okay. It's okay to not be filled up. You don't have to initiate. You might have an undefined G-center and you're trapped in this situation and then you go, I know, I'm going to move across country and go there because then I won't be trapped anymore. Well, congratulations, you've just deepened yourself in the not-self. You've just deepened your sleep. You know, you haven't woken up. You've deepened yourself in that being asleep by initiating and by going out to find the thing instead of, of course, the true self of the undefined G-center is being discerning about what comes to it. Uh, moving on to the eight, you know, they, they want to be strong. More than anything, they want to be strong. And if you make them feel weak, they'll want to initiate to show you how strong they are. Say, uh, like me, hanging gate 34, not supposed to initiate. But if I were an eight and you made me feel weak, I would probably try to demonstrate my strength and, you know, undefined ego and try to prove it and undefined solar plexus. I would hide my weakness and all of these things. You can see the undefined solar plexus is always hiding. Undefined ego is always proving. Undefined G is always searching. Undefined spleen is always holding on for dear life and never letting go. And of course, the, the other uh, five centers have their own themes. But I'm starting with the first four, the kind of strongest. Yeah, and that eight is going to be so driven to be strong and so triggered when they feel weak and triggered by another eight who comes along unless they have a mutual recognition of strength. The nine, their biggest trigger is not being included. You don't let me play with you. Well, it's okay not to be included. It's okay to be canceled from a friend group. That can be, I have the nine wing and I have been canceled from friend groups. Not for any impropriety, but I mean, I shouldn't say canceled. I've been disinvited. You know, I'm a fifth line. Fifth lines are polarizing. It was funny, uh, one friend group I got disinvited from was because I had a friend who was a 6'2", but he's a, he was in his third line phase. 19 years old, brilliant philosopher, student of, uh, of Reza Negaristani, for people who know him. And he got in a huge argument with somebody at a party. And so then at the next party they had, they said, don't bring him. Well, I brought him anyway. Because I wasn't going to let one person tell me not to bring him. Well, sure enough, I was approached and they said, you were told not to bring this person to the party. They're banned from the party. Now you're banned. You're never going to get invited again. And I was never invited again to that friend group. <laughs> Funny enough, you know, it's because I kind of, I, I brought him along. I brought him along. So as a nine, that was very hard for me because especially at that time, I wasn't really much into human design. And I just remember feeling like, what's wrong with me? I'm such a bad person. What did I do? And all this stuff. The nine really wants to be included. I'm not a nine. I'm a one. So at the end of the day, I felt morally justified. I was like, well, I'm right anyway, so I'll just be morally justified. I'll just be right, you know, which isn't any better. It's not any better, believe me. But, um... But because I have a nine wing, I do recognize that. I do feel the nine pain of being excluded, of disharmony, of people being angry. I like things to go back to an equilibrium. I like things to get back to a place where we're all getting along. I like things to be okay in the social group. And the, I mean, I also have a sexual social subtype. So I get it. But I'm here to tell you, if you're a nine, it's okay if people don't invite you. It's okay if things get serious. It's okay if they don't play with you. It's okay if it doesn't stay playful. It's okay. It doesn't have to be damage controlled. Nines damage control everything all the time. You get mad at a nine, the first thing they want to do is damage control with you. And it feels manipulative. And it is manipulative. It is. Because they're so discomforted, they're so uncomfortable with that conflict. So I'm here to tell you, if you're a nine, Conflict is not bad. Someone being angry at you is not bad. You don't have to damage control their anger at you. You don't have to initiate, you don't have to invite yourself over if you're a projector to try to damage control. You don't have to initiate seeing that person to try to damage control. You can just let it be what it is. Okay, so I hope you get the kind of summary of it. I mean, I know we kind of moved through a lot of modalities today and not everyone's going to be on board with all the modalities, but I just wanted to... Lay the groundwork for some kind of synthesis if you know your Enneagram, if you know your Myers-Briggs type. Noticing the triggers, noticing when the mind takes over, noticing the shoulds when a should appears. All of these cases are very should-heavy. Something I really like that Victoria Myers-Bay said, she said, uh, 
There are words in the English language that completely take you out of the moment. And should is one of those words. So I'll leave you with this little tip from Dynamic Deconstructive Psychotherapy. I've shared this before, so some of you may be familiar with it. Anytime you have a should, look at, you have to first take the should and then put the want as the opposite. So if you're saying I should quit smoking, add, but I want a cigarette. If you're saying I should quit my job, but I want to keep working there. I should start this, but I want to stop that. Or, you know, however you want to do it. Then you change it from a but to an and. I should quit smoking and I want a cigarette. I should go for a walk and I want to sit on the couch. I should follow my diet and I want to eat this ice cream. Then the final step is you remove the should entirely. You replace it with a want. I want to follow my diet and I want to eat this ice cream. I want to quit smoking cigarettes and I want to keep smoking cigarettes. I want to go for a walk and I want to sit on the couch. By rephrasing the ands and by eliminating the shoulds, you acknowledge the ambivalence of your own desire. And at that point, you can see more clearly that we all have conflicting desires and you can embrace that. This is especially helpful maybe for the undefined, sorry, for the defined solar plexus or undefined if they're going through an emotional thing. But I think it's really helpful for everyone. I think this is a fundamental aspect of how the mind works is that the moment the should enters the picture, they're splitting. The moment the should enters, I'm splitting and I'm saying something out there is telling me I should do this, you know, but I don't want to. And then the moment that I affirm both desires, even going in opposite directions, I'm affirming ambivalence. I'm affirming ambivalent desire. And at that point, I'm wide awake to my own desires. I am no longer pretending to, you know, I'm no longer disavowing a desire. I'm no longer projecting it outward onto others. I'm no longer expecting someone else to carry the should. I'm acknowledging that there is no should. There's only want. And there are many ones. And they are often contrary to each other. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it.